This behind me is a memorial to engineers. There are many monuments like this in Southampton, but this is no different. This is one of the many memorials that are dedicated to people who have sacrificed their lives during one of the biggest disasters in history. This memorial behind me is called the Engineers Memorial and it is in tribute to the engineers who have tragically lost their lives on a ship, the biggest ship of its time, the Titanic. Over a century ago, the Titanic sank at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean, claiming 1,500 lives. In one of the most tragic, peaceful maritime disasters in history, the story of the Titanic has never failed to capture the minds and the hearts of many people. In this documentary, I will be discussing the events of the infamous story and reflect on how the disaster had challenged mankind and how nature responded to this overruling dominance. They didn't actually know that she was truly sinking for almost an hour. I will be taking you on a journey from the ship's birth to her wreck underneath the sea. She thought he was dead. God himself could not sink the ship. I will be interviewing various guests as they share their theories and tell the stories of survivors whose voices played important roles in the Titanic's life and death. You want to listen to those stories and, and, and in order to get the stories in the purest form, you don't want to disturb anything. Together, we will be retelling the ship's story in a whole new light. This is Titanic, Titan of the Sea.
The memories of the Titanic had brought nothing but sorrow and pain, but over time interest began to grow and soon a whole new generation would open their doors and start to feel hungry for her history and to answer questions about what happened on that cold and moonless April night. This was something that survivors and their families would never dream of, Yet, over a century later, out of the over 7.753 billion people in the world, a half or a quarter of the population would dive into their minds to search for everything they want to know about the Titanic. Following and during the inquiries, the world began assisting families of the victims who perished in the disaster. The assistance that people gave were events like charity galas, scout jamborees, music records, including copies of a song called Be British, and a Titanic Relief Fund which was insinuated by the Lord Mayor of London, Colonel David Burrent. However, the man who was the moving force of the fund was older man Henry Bower, who was the mayor of Southampton. It was a breakthrough for many families, as they were dependent on financial assistance for food, homes and even children's education. All families of the victims were given weekly allowances which were divided into classes. For example, if a family had a breadwinner who was an engineer, they would be put into class A, where widows would receive an income of £2 and children with an income of 7 shillings. The classes were completely divided with families of officers being the highest paid while families of lower class stewards were the lowest. There were also some very tight rules that if broken the relief fund would be ceased immediately. Some understandably weren't happy with the system but there was one case where an unnamed person or group stole a bicycle that belonged to a Mrs Ethel Mould Newman who was a committee of the relief fund in Southampton. Days later it was found at birth 44. No one came forward for this ruthless act but whatever their intentions were it was clear that some had no sympathy for the families who were affected or the people who were helping them. The fund stopped in 1959 but for 47 years it changed the lives of many families one which I am sure that they were grateful for. As time went on, the world began to change. There had been two world wars, the Great Depression, and more events that had happened in 73 years. However, the world didn't forget about the Titanic. The Titanic had become the subject of media and literacy, including a book, A Night to Remember by Walter Lord, and movies including A Night to Remember and James Cameron's Titanic. Some survivors even came to watch the movie premieres of both A Night to Remember and James Cameron's movie. The Titanic also became the subject of a treasure hunt where organisations and people would begin the research to find the hidden jewel of the Atlantic Ocean. The first attempt to find the wreck took place in 1953 by the local Southampton-based salvage company, Risden Beasley Limited. However, their attempts were unsuccessful. In 1973, another man came onto the scene to find the Titanic. His name was Dr. Robert Ballard. Dr. Ballard was an American Navy officer who always had a passion for the sea. He was a genius and his talents were a revolution in science and technology. It was them and his enthusiasm that he had made important discoveries regarding the discovery of shipwrecks. Although he had made many discoveries, his dream was to find the RMS Titanic. His dreams were almost crushed when at the same time, the Walt Disney Company, in collaboration with the National Geographic magazine, 
magazine, British billionaire Sir James Goldsmith and Texas oil man Jack Grimm who sponsored expeditions to find Noah's Ark, Bigfoot and the Loch Ness Monster and expedition leader and filmmaker Michael Harris began their hunt to find the ship. However, the expeditions that were made by Harris and Grimm were really interesting. Grimm and Harris were very determined men who tried to find the Titanic three times between 1980 and 1983. In one attempt, he arranged to have a very cheesy documentary team film the expedition. The documentary was shown like you were watching a young children's show and from what you can see in this footage, Grimm, Harris and their team were travelling to the ocean to the original position where the distress signals were sent, not realising that the wreck was 13 miles to the west. They looked in the spots where the Carpathia was seen when collecting the Titanic's lifeboats and the spot where the Californian was at the time of the sinking. However, because of the bad weather they've had, they were unsuccessful. However, during the filming of the documentary, Grimm and his team missed their opportunity in one shot, the team discovered one propeller blade on the sea floor. Looking closer at the blade, I think that it came from another ship and not the Titanic, despite the fact that the vessel sank in the middle of a busy shipping lane in 1912. But the team was so close to finding the Titanic, passing the wreck within 1.5 miles of its final location. If Grimm, Harris and his team did find the Titanic, then the discovery date wouldn't have been September 1985, but its actual date would be in the summer of 1981. Alas, this wasn't meant to be, but it was good news for Robert Ballard. When he began his expedition in the summer of 1985, Ballard was having trouble getting funding and permission from the Navy. So, in desperation, he signed a deal so he could achieve his lifelong dream. Ballard was uh, a role, uh, he was actually in, uh, the, he was part of the US Navy at the time. He was a US naval, naval officer. Uh, but the the, um, the 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 navy the navy were not interested. He approached them and said, "Look, can we find? I mean, can I go and find the Titanic? She's never been discovered. Let's go and find her." Um, now, she's a she's a, even though she's a large ship, the Titanic, and she yeah we don't at this point we didn't know she was in two pieces. We didn't know that we we'd heard that she was in two pieces, but it hadn't been quite confirmed because. The wreck hadn't been discovered yet. So, it, so he approached the Navy and said, let me go and search for the Titanic. Let's do this. They were not interested in the Titanic. It wasn't their ship. It had nothing to do with them. That was a, it was a, private, that was a private ship. That was a private venture, venture. It wasn't to do with the Navy. They didn't pay for the ship to be built. But what they were interested in, it was a secret, um, it was a secret mission on behalf of the Navy was that, okay, they said, right, we will, we will fund you to go and search for the Titanic, but we want you to go and search for our lost uh, nuclear subs that had been had lost. And they said, right, go and search for them. There was a scorpion and a thresher. And, okay, let's, let's do this. Uh, he said, okay, that's a deal. Let's go and find the, the thresher and the scorpion. During his time... He had two weeks spare during the time he found the Thresher and thinking that he'd go and search, he'd sneakily go and search for the Titanic. He never discovered, he didn't find it. And then on the 1st of September 1985, he'd found the Thresher and the thing, so he had time to go. He'd been given a little, little bit of time to go and search for the Titanic. So they, they, they funded it. And on the 1st of September, he, weren't, he was in bed at the time. Allard was in bed, and he left his crew, you know, searching for the vessel, and then, suddenly, a boiler came into view, and then, they thought, oh, this is something, so everything got, you know, got a bit, and then, 
more of the ship came into view and more and more China and things and so on and so on. What the hell? Oh, God, it's a boiler! It's a boiler! It's like a boiler! Uh, yes, yes. Uh, that's it. They found the Titanic. They knew they'd found the Titanic. <laughs> <laughs> Drew got all excited, went to tell Ballard that they'd, they'd found that they'd found something, that they found the thing. He came on to the, you know, sli you know he came on to the, the the bridge, and that was it. It just exploded, and then suddenly someone said, "Dancing on people's graves," like because it was literally someone had said, "This is the time she goes down," and everything went somber. They were all embarrassed. And then they went on to the they went on to the, the deck and had a ceremony to the lost souls that had gone down. And they did they, they had a memorial service on deck. Then the, the real work came on. Night with Peter Jennings. Good evening. There is no more famous shipwreck. Where it began 400 miles off the coast of Newfoundland. The research team has now sent down colour cameras, which should soon provide clearer The media of went crazy when word got out about the discovery. And soon, the world became fascinated with the Titanic again. A year later, Ballard and his team made another expedition and dived to the wreck 11 times and taking more than 57,000 photographs and hours of video footage to document the wreck. On the 18th of July 1986, recorded tapes were shown to the public from all the pictures and footage from a robot camera named Jason Jr., the team discovered all the staterooms and pairs of shoes that were attached to the victims who tragically perished that night. Ballard said that seeing the shoes touched him as it showed him a reminder of how many innocent lives were cruelly taken that night. They also discovered that the Titanic had split in two. Until that year, most people believed that the ship went down in one piece. How it was ignored and missed is debatable, but scientists, explorers and historians are yet to discover what happened and provide new evidence to share with the world. One such case was a theory that moved forward to Richie Kohler. Richie was a technical diver, historian and presenter of the television show Deep Sea Detectives. In 2003, Richie was given a theory on the Titanic that caught his interest. When I was working on a television program here in the United States called Deep Sea Detectives, we would quite often receive phone calls, emails, and even post uh, with people giving us ideas of, of other shows that we should do. So when an email came through from a gentleman who had been working with the company RMS Titanic that had been currently salvaging objects from the wreck to, to make his museum displays and traveling the world, uh, he had told us that he had seen something underwater on one of those dives collecting artifacts that he thought might change what everybody thought about how Titanic sank. In short, he thought that he had seen um, a piece of steel that had been peeled back as if it was the skin of an apple, as if somebody had skinned a potato and the, the skin had curled back. And he came up with the theory that quite possibly this may actually be a piece of steel that was peeled away from the side of the ship at the moment of impact with the iceberg. Well, as a guy who loves not only exploring shipwrecks, but also contributing to the knowledge, if we could go out there, not just as tourists or filmmakers, but more importantly, as bona fide detectives, if you will, and go out there and find this piece of steel and then look at it carefully, because as many of you know, um, almost all of the hull plates have a very unique rivet pattern. So if we could find this piece of steel, if we could document it by camera of all of the patterns of the rivets on it, it was quite possible that we might have been able to find the smoking gun 
that actually cause Titanic to sink. But getting the opportunity to visit the wreck to solve this mystery wasn't easy, as there were a lot of financial difficulties. Ritchie even had to take out his own life savings and money for his housing mortgage to make this trip happen. However, he and his team were successful, and following the arrangements, they travelled on the research ship the Keldish, which was lent to them for two weeks. Uh, unfortunately, on the very first dive, as you can imagine, um, launching two mirrors. Uh, I went down with uh, uh, the late and legendary Ralph White uh, to document all of what we call the beauty shots and uh, two camera uh, interviews or uh, what we call stand-ups, meaning me, like I'm talking to you, talking to the camera about, like right outside the port is the bow of Titanic. And those kind of things that help put together a television show. While John in Mir 2 uh, with Anatoly, Dr. Anatoly Segalevich was going to go out into the debris field and locate these ribbons of steel. Well, we got to the area and we were absolutely positive it was the same area that David Kincannon had uh, found. And when we saw what the piece of wreckage was, it was clear that it was, although it was a ribbon of steel, it was just a twisted box beam. It was not the outside of the ship. And so, as you can imagine, uh, that evening when we got the, on board the uh, Keldish, we were uh, crestfallen, if you would. As, as epic as this adventure was, our whole reason for being there had just vanished in a puff of smoke. And on board was a, a gentleman, uh, doctor, excuse me, Mr. Billy Lang from Woods Hole Oceanographic, he came along with the cameras to, to help fit them to the mirrors and make sure that everything was working. So Bill Lang, um, obviously seeing us uh, so sad with our heads down, our chins on our chest, um, offered uh, a bit of advice and that uh, unsolicited advice. And because he said that he was so happy to be part of an expedition that finally was going out there to try and look for new stuff, to, to go out there and see if we could add to the base of knowledge. So he made a suggestion. He said that there were very large objects that were outside the known area of debris that had been imaged on sonar, but had never been seen, never had been documented. And so, you know, we kind of picked our chins up and like, well, that's kind of cool, right? Let's go look and see what, what's never been seen. You know, I hate to to quote Star Trek, but to boldly go where no one had ever gone before. And that's exactly what we did. You know, we went far, 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 to quote David Kingannon, away from the wreck. And we located not one, but two incredibly large um, with pieces of the bottom, the double bottom of, of Titanic, the actual bottom of the ship. And when we imaged them all around and uh, Experts like Ken Marshall and Park Stevenson looked at them. They realized that the two pieces fit perfectly together like a puzzle. And that together they comprised 100 feet by 80 feet of the bottom of Titanic, the actual bottom of the ship, where she exactly broke into two. And that these two pieces probably had been attached like a butterfly and then fell through the water like this until they broke apart and then fell to the bottom. And so the, the other thing about it, which was totally breathtaking, was that the red anti-fouling paint was still working. In other words, the bottom of the ship was red. And it, I mean, it's shining back in our lights, bright red. And as you're aware, all of the bottom of Titanic, both the bow and the stern section is buried in the mud. So this is the first time you can actually see the red paint because everywhere else it's underneath the mud. So it may seem at first blush that, okay, so you found some wreckage, you found two broken pieces of the ship, but there were experts. Now, I don't profess to be a naval architect or a marine engineer. I'm an explorer. I'm a scuba diver. And I understand shipwrecks. I understand how ships break apart. I understand how to find things underwater. So, of course, you bring this information the same way we gave it to uh, uh, Ken Marshall and Park so that they can analyze it and Bill Sauter other people looking at it and 
a, a marine engineer came up with the theory that this quite, quite possibly was an indication of, quote unquote, Titanic's last moment. And when he said that, it was like click. It's like, well, that's the documentary film, that these pieces of the ship were the moment where it went from being an intact ship to pop, and then it became a shipwreck. We built not one, but two subsequent uh, documentary films based on missing pieces and then Titanic's final moment where an expert came up with the theory that it's quite possible the ship was built weekly and it was a design flaw in what's called an expansion joint. And I'm, I'm not gonna go into too much of the great detail, but if you travel over a bridge or you're in a very large building, you're always going to see what's called an expansion joint. An expansion joint is so a large structure can, can expand and contract with heat, or in the case of a bridge, move in the wind so that it won't crack. Well, very large ships usually would have an expansion joint where as the ship's going over a wave, it can bend a little bit and not break. He came up with the theory that these expansion joints were poorly designed, and that's why Titanic when the stern came out of the water, broke. And it is a fact, it did break exactly at an expansion joint. But the theory is, well, is it that the ship was weak? Or was it a poor design? Was it a combination? Or were the forces that day just so overwhelming that no matter what, the ship was gonna break because you can't take that much of the back of the ship and stick it out of the water, it's gonna break off. Ritchie wasn't the only one to mention the theory on the Titanic's breakup. There have been many others over the years, and there are some that you can still see and read online. I even came up with one, but because of time, I was unable to complete it. However, while I was trying to write my own theory on the breakup, I had this idea of how the breakup happened. I had a few ideas where I involved a term called the laden frost effect and explained how the cold liquid nitrogen temperature, the air pressure and the weight of the water at sea level had caused a minor explosion in the triple expansion engine room. This I believed, explained why the middle section of the wreck was missing. Although I never got the chance to explain this, I realise that despite what people share, whether the information is right or wrong, the truth may never be known. What is known is that Mother Nature may reclaim the Titanic as her own. When another expedition was made in 2019 by DSV Limiting Factor, the team had made a shocking discovery. They discovered that the Titanic was disintegrating quicker than previously thought. Because of this, many people now believe that the wreck is likely to disappear within a lifetime. Why? Well, this is due to a source of bacteria called Halomonas titanicae, which is feasting on the steel. Once it was apparent that the Titanic had little time on the ocean floor, a race had begun to retrieve as many items as possible. One of the last artefacts are at the bottom of the sea and hidden within the wreck known as the last voice of the Titanic, is the Marconi Wireless Telegraph. When I began researching the story for the planned attempt to raise the Marconi Wireless Telegraph, I was surprised about how the telegraph became a political issue. The idea of recovering the telegraph was made forward by Park Stevenson. In our interview, he explains why he wanted to put it forward. The shipwreck is actually the last, usually the last surviving witness to a disaster or an event event, like a World War II battle, for instance, um, you will have human eyewitnesses to a disaster, and they have memories which may or may not be correct, which may or may not have been compromised over time, which may or may not have assimilated others' memories as they all share their stories. But a, but a wreck, the steel on the bottom, steel doesn't lie. Um, you hear that often. Uh, but what does happen with steel is it can be misinterpreted. 
And that's where you can get various analyses of a shipwreck on the bottom. Two people can look at the same steel and come up with two different conclusions. So I leave the analysis of eyewitness descriptions to other experts in the community. And I try these days to focus on what the wreck is trying to tell us. Our generation, and basically the first, what I call the first generation of Titanic explorers, we've been lucky to have the wreck there for us to explore and to learn from. And the wreck has stories to tell, and you want to listen to those stories. And, and, and in order to get the stories in the purest form, you don't want to disturb anything. But as in any archaeological site, which Titanic is a marine archaeological site, hasn't been treated like one, but there are steps being taken now to establish Titanic as an archaeological site. And I don't want to use the word exploited, but um, explored, studied along, the, you know, along archaeological rules. There comes a time when there's some artifacts that are in danger due to ongoing corrosion, collapse, deterioration, et cetera, that need to be recovered so that they can continue to be available for future generations to come. Because like I said, we are lucky that we have the wreck with us today. Future generations are not going to have the wreck. It's going to keep breaking down and breaking down over time. It's not disappearing in 30 years like some people claim, but it, it's, it's going to eventually break down. And um, as you would with any other archaeological site, there are things that you want to save from destruction, from eradication, so that future generations could continue to have a personal link to this disaster. Now, Titanic enthusiasm is never going to go away. It, 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 it appeals to generation after generation after generation. And as the wreck deteriorates, future generations are going to be losing those personal links to the wreck. So in certain instances, when there are what I would call historically significant artifacts that are in danger of being destroyed by the ongoing collapse of the structure around it, then conceptually, I've made the argument that these artifacts need to be recovered. You can decide when you recover if you want to restore it to working condition, which I believe the Marconi uh, motor generator set could so that you could hear a Titanic spark again, or you can leave it as is. That's a decision that others can make. Regardless, we, it was my argument that we should recover the Marconi apparatus and um, in as non-intrusive a way as possible. And that was a key point. The original plan to retrieve the telegraph was simple, yet the reality of collecting it would be uncertain. If the plans went ahead, another expedition would have to start. Suddenly, the plan got leaked. When the world knew what happened, the matter began to cause a debate on both sides of the Atlantic, and it went as far as going to court. This case went on for quite some time, and the Telegraph gained attention from the RMS Titanic Incorporated, who have been salvaging artefacts for years. By doing this, they would have saved another artefact, which would introduce a new generation of enthusiasts to the story of the Titanic. However, the National Oceanic and Atmosphere Administration said the Telegraph should remain untouched. Salvaging it would be a disrespectful violation. By doing so, likely, cutting into the hull would possibly destroy the wreck before the bacteria would finish eating the wreck. After much debate, the US Federal Court granted permission for RMS Titanic to retrieve the telegraph in 2020. The plan was underway and it looked like everything was ready to go. Suddenly, in the new year, the expedition was cancelled because of the COVID-19 pandemic. As of 2022, there has not been further plans or expeditions to the wreck to retrieve the telegraph. 
But it is not just the Telegraph that has raised the issue of recovering artefacts from the wreck. There have been many arguments about leaving the site alone and those recovering items for historical research or selling to private collectors for museums or individuals to have all to themselves. One person who is against recovering the artefacts from the wreck is David. While we were discussing the future of the Titanic, David shared a memory where he visited Edith after he saw the discovery on the news. I remember saying to my mother, when they found the Titanic, I went up to her flat, she was half asleep in her armchair, and I said, Mother, they found the Titanic. And the exact words she said was, never. I said, yes, I have. The next words she said was, what on earth are they going to do with it? And then I said to her, they can't do anything, Mother, Mother, it's too deep. And then she said, that's good then. That's my father's grave. Now that's as it's always been. And we look upon that as a grave site. So it's the same if I go to the cemetery. I don't fiddle with other people's graves. But now they've picked it clean. It should be left alone. Hearing David's words made my spine shiver. When we had finished recording, I was speechless. I couldn't speak for an hour and I wanted to cry. And although my enthusiasm turned into guilt, my feelings did not stop me from visiting museums, reading about the ship and speaking with historians and other descendants. However, unlike David, Jake, Tom and Sam agree with the recovering artefacts of the wreck and protecting the history of the Titanic. If, if artefacts are not recovered, like the big piece for instance, or we, the, the, the story would just die as the ship deteriorates. Bringing up artefacts is important for future generations to keep Titanic its legacy alive, its story alive. When, when I've gone to museums, I've been to museums myself, and I've seen a pair of shoes from the Titanic wreckage, or I've seen a life jacket or something. And I've heard stories where people go to Las Vegas and see the big piece. It touches them. It gives them that, that close connection with those on board, those that perished that night. And I strongly believe myself that artifacts should be recovered because as Titanic sadly deteriorates that history is going to go with her. I've always liked the original stance on it where they, they don't mind exploring the Titanic but they don't take any items from within the ship. They only take items that were thrown from the ship on its way down and I'm like okay that's not a bad idea because that's still showing respect to the people who were on board the ship. And you also have to remember that there's a lot of people today that want to that want to remember the Titanic and see things from it. So I'm a little bit, it depends on the item. It depends on the artifacts. It depends on like what they do with the item. So like if there's pieces of the Titanic that are up for public sale, like um, 
you know, the big piece, the big piece of steel that, or the hull that they recovered, they brought, they brought that up and there's big pieces of it in museum. But here's ultimately, if stuff is brought up and then it's kind of up for public sale and everything like that, and there's a general, people can get them like Titanic coal or stuff like that. I'm a little bit more loose on it because the majority or the big part of those artifacts you can see. So like the big piece and all that, like what I have is literally like probably not even a centimeter. It's just a little tiny little speck of what it is. So I know they just, they just slid, slid it off and put it in a pen. But so that stuff I'm a little bit okay with, but like when you go down to the ship and then you bring up something like that's a one of a kind piece and then it goes up for public auction and then somebody pays $10 million or pounds or whatever for it. And you never see it again. You see it like something that really has historical significance to the rack. I'm a little bit, I don't, I don't like that too much. I, I do believe that frequent visiting of the rack is causing it to deteriorate. But I think that what is gained from respectable visits is far more valuable because we're able to learn so much from it. We're able to continue discovering new stories that were lost to, to the sinking. Um, thanks to these visits, we're able to recover artifacts. I am in favor of, of the recovery of, of artifacts as long as it doesn't absolutely, you know, as long as you're not cleaving into the ship and ripping it open to pull stuff out. I am fully in support of preserving things from that disaster. And that helps us maintain the legacy. We also have to remember that people who, it is, a, it is a grave. There were people who are inside of the ship and that's, but they didn't die down there. They died on the surface two and a half miles away. That is the truly hallowed ground above them. Down here, I don't believe it's grave robbing. If, if they were pulling artifacts out to sell and, and make, as much of a profit as they could off of it, I would say that's tasteless. You shouldn't be doing that. But when it's going into a museum, when it's being shared with the world, and when this information is being used to further the stories, I think that's preserving their legacy more than anything else. Otherwise, she would be forgotten. If, if we just left everything down there and if we let the ship just fall to the elements and, and decay, I think... Uh, She'd eventually be forgotten, and so would those who were on board. Despite being located under 4,000 metres underwater, it would be impossible to raise the Great Liner. Not even a Bacchuscath could raise her. The Titanic's future of being raised to the surface is different compared to the raising of the Mary Rose, which was discovered and raised from the seabed around the same time as the discovery of the Titanic. She'd been in her spot for too long and it is dangerous to consider raising the bow, stern or both. I for one am glad about this because it is a grave site and agreeing with David, I think it should be treated as such. However, if an organisation, scientists or explorers have permission to raise an artefact or explore the ship for scientific research, as long as they treat the Titanic with respect, then I am in support of this too. It is a diversional choice and not many people will agree, but since I have no relation to a survivor or nor am I a qualified explorer or scientist, then I prefer to let others decide on what is best for the Titanic. However, what I do know is the fact that the history of the Titanic changed my life. Since filming the documentary, I have come to appreciate the Titanic story more than I did when I was 11 years old. I came across the Titanic during a floating sinking video in science class when I started secondary school in 2005. I became fascinated and I couldn't get the ship off my mind. When I got home, I asked my mum, what's the Titanic? She said she had no clue, so I went to Google to know more and I never went back. I would have never dreamed that 20 years later I would film my own documentary on the Titanic. In truth, it was one of the best decisions I have ever made in my life so far. 
But during filming, I had one question. I didn't know what I thought about it. But as time went on, I realised that this question plays a strong part within the Titanic community. How do you think that the Titanic should be remembered? Um, I would say a disastrous wreck, definitely, with a great loss of lives. And it was one of the unknowns of Mother Nature. Mother Nature won. You know, she won because that ice floating down the, from the Labrador Straits came down early that year because of the warmer weather. And if it hadn't been for that, she may have reached New York, one freak iceberg. So you could say one, one iceberg changed history. I, I think the Titanic should re be remembered, A, respectfully, number one. Um, there are a lot of things out there um, that kind of joke about the Titanic. And I love humor. It's my favorite. There are some things you just don't touch. And mm -hmm. tragedies like that, um, you, don't, you don't touch it. So I think first and foremost, it needs to be remembered respectfully. Um, secondly, I think it needs to be remembered for just a lot of people say like the, how beautiful she was and the grandeur and all that stuff. But I really think that that leaves out the third class a lot. So I would say she needs to be remembered as a gateway to a new time period and these different things that, so I, I truly think that she needs to be remembered as um, a piece of history that truly got humanity from one place to another place. All the all the work that I've ever done for Titanic has now narrowed down to one thing, and that is I'm working almost all of my Titanic work right now is dedicated solely to establishing the wreck as an archaeological site. I want to try and um, document every all the information that we have gathered to date, and um, and and make it available so that it can be a reference for continued exploration of the site. And instead of being kind of informally done by individual explorers as it has in the past, if we can satisfy the criteria for it as an archaeological site with surveys to establish a baseline, um, then it can be treated just like any other archaeological site that you can think of, like an Egyptian archaeological site or Pompeii or Stonehenge or, or, or any archaeological dig that you're aware of. You've got to ask yourself, you know, was the Titanic the Britannic, the Olympic, badly designed. In fact, Olympic went on to have a, an amazing career. She had a full career, a successful career. Uh, to me, I think the best way to remember it is to remember the people who were there and uh, to always remember that uh, they weren't fictional figures. You know, Some of them have become almost mythic, like Molly Brown is almost a mythic figure now. But I think the best way to remember them is that they were human. There were no, there were heroes that night, but there really weren't villains. Um, there were just people making decisions. And um, I think remembering them as flesh and blood is, uh, is the best way to carry it on. I think there's a reason why Titanic resonates with us today, but society is so disorganized and, and so disagreeable with itself. Like everyone has their own opinions about things and then they argue it defend like defend it to no end I, I think there's a reason why the titanic resonates among that and why there's this fantastical obsession with it today and it's because we need role models everybody needs role models
And the Titanic gives us that in, in so many different ways. There's heroic men, there's heroic women, there's heroic, um, there's heroic people who are in first class, there's heroes in third class. You can take, you can find the hero that you need anywhere on the Titanic. You, you know, no matter what you're looking for, it, there's somebody's story who, who can resonate with you. Be it, um, you know, if, if you are, depending on your own beliefs, you know, there, there were heroic, um, on board the Titanic, there were people who acted as heroes who their beliefs were, were very secular and, and, and socially progressive. And then there were absolute heroes who were conservative there were religious figures who were heroes and yeah there, there were some cowards on the titanic for sure but they were far outshadowed by the heroes that night i hope that people collect as many stories you know like this one as they can because this is pretty much straight from uncle al's mouth and from the archives where i found out that they were actually fleeing their jobs and they, that their boss doubted that somebody was really sick and there was a lot of detective work but I wish people would do it. And I know I've encouraged Shelly to work on her family's history. There's a lot of debate that I hear on this end of the world about um, should they raise what's left of the Titanic and bring it up? And there's some who say, no, no, it's a graveyard. And some say, oh yeah, bring it up. Well, I always said, when people ask me that directly, I say, well, I have to go with my uncle on that because he always had this vision that they would find the Titanic they would pump it with styrofoam and it would float to the top and then they would sail it into New York or tow it into New York. And then he would get on board and walk to his cabin and find his gold pieces. That was always his goal. And uh, so that was kind of cute and kind of funny. And, uh, but he always assumed they would find it, raise it and bring it home. And I have no differences with that. I think that was his desire as a survivor and his um, vision for it. And I think that was a, it was a good vision. I mean, I, I respect that people lost their lives on it, but um, I, I, I believe that as, as a, the main carrier of his story, I mean, he has other descendants as well, but as one who has written a story, I know that was his desire. And I feel like I, I, I would support that carrying out of it because that was what he wanted. And incidentally, they found the Titanic on his and Sylvia's anniversary and he turned, he would have turned 100 a week later. So they found it almost in his 100th birthday. If he just you know, lived nine more years, I think he'd have been thrilled that they found it. And I think he would have loved to have seen it again. I think he would have taken one look at it and said, well, they're not gonna float it with styrofoam. I guess I'm not getting my gold back. But I think he would have loved seeing the images of it. He always wanted to see it again. He felt as though they would find it and you know, that he would see it again. And, and when he realized as an old man, that wasn't going to happen, he turned to my two sisters and me and would say, we can have the gold pieces. You know, he said, these are, you can have these gold pieces when they find them. Of course, you know, nobody would enforce that. I don't think anybody would believe us, but nevertheless, we were told that frequently and always used to tease about it. In fact, when we go to a Titanic exhibit today and there's any kind of a gold piece in there, which could be from any country, we'll say to the guard, hey, those belong to us. And they'll just shrug. They won't, they, I'm surprised we don't get thrown out of places, but we're like, our great uncle was on the Titanic and he said we could have his gold pieces. Do you think that's one of them? They're like, you know, they look away. Another crazy person, you know. <laughs> what I think makes the Titanic story so fascinating is how unique it is. Because you have this giant ship with all with people from all corners of society. You know, you have the wealthy elite to the immigrants just trying to make a new life for themselves. You know what I mean? And it's, then you have this thing happen and this ship sinks so slowly that there's time for all of this stuff to happen. And then you've got your heroes, you've got your villains, like the people who just wanted to save themselves. You've got the men in the engine room who knew they weren't gonna get out of there, but they stayed just to keep the lights going, to keep the power for the telegraph going. You've got Frederick Barrett, you know, the boiler room guy, like the fireman who like, I mean, seriously, everything that he went through that night, oh my gosh. Like, I mean, he dodged death so many times that night. Mm -hmm. And the band playing Near My God to Thee right there at the end and the captain. There's just so much about Titan that shows the best and the worst of humanity. You know what I mean? And like, what would you do if you were there that night? You know, how would you behave? How would you act? It's, it's not a story of, of steel and coal and ice. It's a story of flesh and blood and bone. It's a story of people. It's a story of hubris, incredible wealth and opulence, and at the far end of the spectrum of people 
uh, literally coming with everything they own in a satchel to start a new life in a new world. And so for a person who can look beyond the drama of the event and more into the hearts and dreams of the people on board, I think it's a, it's a bigger it's a bigger story. I think the story is about, you know, obviously the tragedy of many of those lives, but also, if you will, the resonance of the people who survived, the people who went on, you know, and, and had to, to live with the memory of that evening and how it stays in the social conscious. 1,496 people lost family members and were not as lucky as me. I did not lose any family there. And, you know, some people do think of it as a grave, as a, um, you know, a site that needs to be uh, preserved. I'm very careful because um, if they feel that way, they're certainly entitled to that feeling. And, I, you know, as I said, gratefully, my family lived. I think a lot of things, I mean, it was a tragedy. It's the main thing we all know it is it was a tragedy. and. I should hope that lessons have been learned from it and I think that people have looked into the ship itself and what happened and the events leading up and so hopefully that that won't happen again but also the bravery of people the bravery of the people that stayed on the ship and didn't want to get into lifeboats because they wanted to stay with their families and yeah and the people that survived as well like how strong they must have been to get through every single day knowing that their family weren't with them and They've lost people and they've voiced, they've still woke up every day, surviving each day following an event like that is quite a strong thing to do, I think. As for me, well, I think that the Titanic should be remembered as part of our world history. The disaster gave us lessons on how to travel at sea safely, how important it is to think about Mother Nature and how important it is to keep her story alive for future generations. It's like the words I say to myself for any historical subject. If you don't appreciate history, you will never understand the world we live in. Even if it's underneath the Atlantic Ocean, over a century later.